So I've been a journalist for about 10 years, but I started out as a feature writer, not as somebody who did the sort of reportage that I'm now known for. Then about 2004, something happened, um, something that changed not just the course of my writing career, but of my life. Um, something took place in Vidarbha, which is an agricultural district near Bombay, the city I was living in at the time. Farmers had been co committing suicide since about, for a couple of years prior to that. But in 2004, the rate of suicide went up to one every 12 hours. Farmers hung themselves, they poured pesticide down their throat. And suddenly, Vidarbha, this rural outpost that the mainstream media, when we talk of the mainstream media in India, we always talk of the English media, had never visited, was suddenly overrun with reporters. And you could only read about Vidarbha on the front pages of the newspapers. But the more I read, the more I realized that what I was reading was a view from the outside in. And what I wanted to read, and I think what all of us wanted to read at the time, was a view from the inside. So I did something that was, for me at the time, completely out of character. I threw aside whatever feature story I was working on, and I upped and went to Vidarbha. I traveled to several villages, I met with dozens of families, and I started writing about these families. And I wrote about them the way I had wanted to read about them, which is to say every time I found myself editorializing, I pressed delete. I reminded myself that my middle-class opinions, no matter how sensitive or well-informed, could never encompass, let alone understand, what it means to live a hard, difficult life in a country where there is no limit to how hard and tough life can be. And so I wrote the way I thought the families of Vidarbha, the widows and the children who had been left behind to take over the burden that their fathers had left them, would write if they had the opportunity. That was a changing point for me. I never went back to feature writing. And I started traveling in rural India. But I also wrote about urban communities that were marginalized and weren't represented. I wrote about hijras, or the transgender community, about sex workers, about the pimps who ran the best scams in the city. But I also wrote about rag pickers and domestic workers and kids who didn't have enough to eat. People whose lives I wanted the privileged minority to understand. Because by then I was very clear about what I wanted to do with my writing career. I wanted to write about people who didn't have to look around them to understand that there was significant unevenness in our social and economic development. They didn't have to look around because they could just look in the mirror. And there were a couple of ways that I wanted to write. I wanted to write, number one, in a way that would interest my readers. I wanted to write in a way that they could find a bond between themselves and the people that I was writing about. Because no matter how different you are, no matter how much you suffered or where you live or what you do, you will always have something in common with the person seated beside you. And I wanted to write in the vocabulary of the people that I was representing. Because I so strongly feel, and if you read Beautiful Thing and you see the way that I've tried to use language, that more than almost anything else, language tells of who we are and where we've been. It speaks of our experience of the world. Now, to get these stories, I have to tell you that I spent more time convincing people to talk to me and building trust than I did actually asking questions. Because when you try and interview somebody who doesn't have a product to sell, or who's very, very poor, or who is breaking the law every single day of their life, there is nothing in it for them to speak to a reporter. It is at best a waste of their time, and at worst an invitation to trouble. So I used to say, look, I don't want to ask you any questions. No questions equal no pressure. All I want to do is hang around, that's it. And when I would get the permission to hang around, and sometimes that permission came after a very long time, and I, um, you know, very reluctantly, I would attempt to be so low maintenance that when the people I was writing about left the room, they wouldn't realize they had left me behind. Um, I would also be very honest about why I wanted to interview them. Um, I wanted just to know how they lived. I was interested. And when they thought me and, and never minced their words about calling me a bit of a freak for my interest, I accepted that because I still think that might be the case. And for all the questions I asked them, I, uh, every once in a while, got a question in return. The usual things that even other people would ask me, for example, if you're married, what are you doing here? 
if you have a husband, where are your children? Or in the case of the hijras, while poking my chest, why don't you wear a pointy bra? And I would attempt to answer their questions with as much kindness and openness as they had offered me their time. At some point, I fell into the world of Bombay's dance bars. It happened after I was introduced to a 19-year-old bar dancer called Leela, who is, I don't know what other word to use, but to say the star of beautiful thing. Leela was introduced to me by a source in what I call the bar and brothel business, the manager of a bar that I'm pretty sure was a brothel. Leela was beautiful, she was beguiling, she was cunning as hell. She flirted with everyone, including me. She lied, she smoked, she drank, she cut herself. She told me she had to have sex with men for the money, which I always thought was strange because I'm pretty sure she had more money than many of the men she had sex with. Knowing Leela was an adventure, but it was also one of the most painful journeys I've ever undertaken. Because someone like me will never know what it's like to be 13 years old and pimped out by her father to the cops. Or around the same time to realize that she would be better off on the streets than within sight of her parents. Or when she was still 13, to just run away from home, take a train all the way to Bombay, and once there, find the best job she could, and if that job was bar dancing, then so be it. And she did find, it, find a job in a dance bar, a bar called Night Lovers, a name that tells you everything you need to know, not just about the dance bar itself, but about the business of bar dancing. Now, I know that many of you have never been inside a dance bar. Perhaps you haven't been to Bombay either. Um, that's fine. The first time I went to a dance bar was just a couple of months before I met Leela. The way I usually describe a dance bar to people who have no idea what I'm talking about is by saying it's a strip club, except nobody strips. And all the so-called strippers are dressed in saris or lehenga cholis, and they dance vigorously to Bollywood music on a stage. To show their appreciation, the customers, who are always men, throw money or uh, hand over money to the bar dancers. But in a respectable bar or a legitimate bar, there is no touching allowed. There is no speaking permitted. So anything the, bar, the customer hopes to get out of that brief and solely for him mesmerizing interaction, he's going to have to try and get outside the bar after hours. And that was when, in the words of Leela, the women stopped dancing for the men, and the men started dancing for the women. But I'm going to show you a clip from a film that will explain bar dancing better than I can. It's from a marvelous Hindi film called Chandni Bar, which is set in the world of Bombay's dance bars. And it stars a very fine actress, Tabu, as a young woman who is forced into what we call the bar line by her family. Initially completely terrorized and scandalized at the thought of having to dance in front of men, she realizes it's the best thing that could have happened to her. Because once she becomes financially independent, she will never again have to depend on the people who had thrown her by the wayside. In this clip, uh, Tabu is still getting used to dancing on stage in front of men, and she's already so desirable that she attracts the attention of a local thug. Here we go. So that was uh, a clip from Chantani Bar, and I hope you uh, now have a little idea of what the world of the dance bars was like. Uh, dance bars mushroomed in Bombay from around the 1970s, started with about you know, five and then went on to a dozen. And by 2005, which is when I met Leela and when I started writing uh, Beautiful Thing, there were 1,500 dance bars only in Bombay, and they collectively employed about 75,000 women. But four months after I met Leela, the story that I was writing appeared like it would come to an end. The government of Maharashtra, of which Bombay is the capital, came to a very strange conclusion, two-pronged. First, that bar dancers were responsible for all the immorality that Bombay was festering with. And second, that these 75,000 girls were responsible for all the criminal acts committed against Bombay's 18 million citizens. So the bright idea they came to, this was without any warning, without any conversation on the matter permitted, was to ban bar dancing. And in doing so, they claimed it would be a double whammy. No immorality, no criminality. Bombay would be a great clean city again. 
So what this meant was that young girls, who because of their very low caste or class, had never had the opportunity to become literate, who had run away from home, who had almost without exception been the victims of either incest or rape or gang rape, or all three, who had developed addictions because of all the assault they had suffered, addictions to chewing tobacco or alcohol, and who had no money saved for themselves because no decent bank would let them in through the door, were essentially thrown out in the street and told to get what they called a real job. But more about those real jobs in a minute. Now, until then, any bar dancer who had lived out her entire career, which would have been until she was in her early 30s. By the time she entered into her early 30s, she would have been told, look, I mean, you're getting a bit long in the tooth. Why don't you start, you know, waitressing? But if she had been allowed to work for that entire period, she would have, almost without a doubt, earned a considerable amount of money. And to give you an idea of what I mean, when I was working as a full-time reporter for a very respectable magazine, Leela was still earning at least twice of what I was every month. Um, so a woman who had been allowed to earn would have without a doubt sent home a chunk of that money to her family in the village. And they would have invested that money in land or a house. She would have educated her children, the children she had had from customers. She would have also educated her siblings' children. And so with education, a land and a house, her family would have had the opportunity to enter the mainstream, which means that if they had chosen not to in the future, they would not have needed to put another child, another daughter, into the bar line. Once a woman became a bar dancer, she was condemned as a prostitute, and there was nothing she could do, no amount of money she could earn to, to bring herself out of that, but she could save her family. So what the ban did in 2005 would not just affect 75,000 women, but the men and the women, and more importantly, the children who these women were supporting. And it also brought to a complete standstill the ecosystem that had developed around these dance bars. So, for example, the auto rickshaw drivers who would drop these girls to the dance bar every evening at 7 p.m., the taxi drivers who would bring them home back in the morning at 3 a.m., the makeup artists, costume designers, the panwala who would stand outside the dance bar and feed these girls pan so they would manage to stay awake for all the hours they were dancing. All of that came to an end. Now to the question of a real job. Do you know what a certain kind of man or a certain kind of woman means when they ask a young girl like Leela to get a real job? I think you do. But I would like to tell you what happens when a girl like Leela declines to get that real job. And I'd like to do this by reading an extract from Beautiful Thing. At this point in the book, Leela had been thrown out of Night Lovers and she had been forced to enter the vast very complex but completely hierarchical world of Bombay sex industry. They took my refusal personally, as though by refusing to dance naked, I was refusing their friendship. To my face they said, as you wish. But that night they got me real drunk, so drunk I couldn't walk. Finally, when all the other girls had left, they took me to the bathroom. They threw me against a wall, and one of them took off her belt and started beating me. I bought that belt for her. It was Tommy Hilfiger. Good brand. After they beat me, they pushed me into their car. One of them said, have you met my brother? He's very handsome. You want to be a good girl, don't you? You don't want to do sex anymore, isn't that right? He'll show you. We drove for a few minutes, we got out. They made me walk up to the fifth floor. Her brother was waiting for us, him and his five friends. They showed me. They showed me all night. Then, when it was time for them to leave, they opened the door and kicked me down the stairs. They forgot my clothes and chappals. Leela reached into her pocket and, extracting something, handed it to me. I looked at it and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was a tooth. A tooth that this gang of boys had somehow managed to pull out of her mouth while they were teaching her a lesson. And the lesson, of course, was that because she was a bar dancer, she was also a prostitute, and there was no point in her trying to be anything else, trying to be better than they were. I want to tell you that the ban was repealed and that this story has a happy ending. But I'm not going to do that, not because it wasn't or because the story doesn't. You're going to have to read the book for that. 
But because I would like you to think the way I had to think about what might constitute happiness to a young girl, only 19, who said that when she was a child, she didn't know that such a thing existed. And when she did find out as an adult, she desired it so much that she put everything she had on the line to try and experience happiness. So I thought about what made Leela happy. I know that hanging out with her best friend Priya and playing drinking games to Bollywood music made her very happy. I know that going to Kamatipura, which is a red light district in Bombay, heading straight to the Hijra brothel, all her friends were there, and dancing with them till dawn cracked open the night sky, that made her happy. And I also know that dreaming about her manager, a very unattractive middle-aged man who always brought up his bowel movements and conversations and who already had a wife and children and would never have married her, also made her happy. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it was something else entirely. It was the same thing, funnily enough, that made me happy when I switched the course of my writing life. And I wager makes all of you happy. It was the freedom to be left alone to do what she did best. And what Leela did best was dance. And the dance that she performed wrenched her out of this life of poverty that she had been force fed, and it made her a happy person. So, not entirely a happy story, but not a sad one. It can't be, because every day that I spent with her, she taught me, and everyone else around, that no one can hand you defeat if you choose not to accept it. It's an absolutely stunning lesson. And the fact that it comes from somebody who had such little power over her own life still blows my mind. Thank you. <laughs>